So in the past couple of lectures, uh, what I've been trying to do was set the stage so that you could uh, understand the literature of the huge amount of work that's currently being done by many groups around the world on numerical simulations of neutron star mergers. So the, the background that we've seen in the past couple of lectures, the development of models, particularly ideal general relativistic magnetohydrodynamics, and the underlying finite volume and finite difference numerical methods that are currently being used are fundamental into the explosion of work that is exploring parameter space in essentially all of the, the different neutron star parameters that go in. So particularly the, the masses of the neutron stars and their, their mass ratios, what their compositions are, magnetic field strength, magnetic field configurations, also the impact of the different types of equations of state effective equations of state, uh, relativistic mean field equations of state, and also the parameters and underlying physics that go into making those up. And you'll see a lot of work worrying about turbulence and the development of small scale features and the, the impact of that on the instabilities of the post-merger remnant and how the finite temperature properties of the system will propagate and impact on the observable signals through reactions and radiation transport and so on and so forth. So even this morning there was um, another paper by uh, Reduce's group on the impact of turbulence and how that changes the qualitative and quantitative observable signatures of neutron star mergers. So today's lecture is going to look at some of the directions in the in the short to medium term, some of the uh, physical models, some of the um, numerical techniques that people are exploring and that we may need in order to take the uh, next steps. Now, after a relatively short introduction, there's going to be a long first section, break for questions, and then a short section on, on the numerical methods. And then I hope we will have uh, a, a time for a reasonably extended question period at the end. Okay, so to emphasize how far we've got to go compared to the theoretical models, the cartoon sketch on the left hand side was the picture I used in the first lecture for the impact of our, um, our choices of physical model that go into our numerical simulation. So we're treating the star as ideal uh, we're treating it in the uh, relativistic MHD approximation. That means that we can't take into account the extended exterior magnetic field. We can't take into account the structure that there is through the crust. We can't take into account, except in certain average senses, the uh, structure through the um, so-called so pasta phases as we move through the uh, outer parts of the core and into the inner parts of the core. Uh, in the same sense, we can't take into account the, the importance of magnetic vortices, neutron vortices, neutron superfluids, superconductivity, and a huge range of other small scale physics. Um, so the composition of the inner core in particular has uh, only just been started to touch on um, and that there's lots of uh, people who think that, for example, uh, lattice QCD will teach us a lot about uh, the behavior of, for example, free quarks in the core of certain neutron stars. And whatever your particular feelings about uh, any one of these particular physical models, you can see that there's a very long way to go before our numerical modeling can actually tackle any of these individual topics. So this immediately comes back to one of the questions that in different guises uh, appeared in the, the question sessions and in the chat over the past few days, which is how important is the impact of adding any particular physics? So I think it, it was particularly mentioned uh, uh, with respect to, um, to dissipation and viscosity. 
So there's two particular responses to that. Um, the, the first response is an appeal to what's known as multi-scale theory. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, let's suppose that there are two different bits of physics, like, for example, hydrodynamics and then the magnetic field on top of it. And what we'll do is we'll write each of those models uh, in terms of a differential operator. So L1 here is going to describe the, the fundamental basic physics that we're interested in, the hydrodynamics, and L2 is going to describe the the bit that we're assuming is smaller, so smaller in amplitude, acting on shorter scales, faster times, and so on and so forth. So the full physical model that we have evolves whatever our observable quantities Q are using the, the base model plus a small correction from our second piece of physics. Now, multiscale theory says that if you average over appropriate length and time scales, then this first model, dtq is equal to L1q plus epsilon L2q, is indistinguishable in an appropriate sense from dtq equals L1q. When we allow ourselves the freedom to modify the parameters that go into describing q, so modifying the initial data, modifying the constitutive relationships, for example. And this holds true as long as we're only considering relatively short times, so time scales proportional to one on our small scale epsilon. So we can use this to roughly quantify the impact of the, the new physics. So epsilon has the dimensions of the time scale, so in order to explicitly quantify this, what we would have to do is say, what's our time scale that we're interested in, which for uh, remnant simulations of SGRBs and kilonovi is roughly going to be around a second. And then we have to look at the uh, generic properties of our physical model and try and find an appropriate time scale or find appropriate length scales uh, and velocity scales, or dissipation scales and length scale squared, and so on and so forth. So it's all going to depend on the properties of the differential operator and the size of this epsilon term, and so on and so forth. So for example, viscosity we would usually think of as depending on the Reynolds number, and then also the length scale on which it acts. So the length and or time scale. So some sort of Reynolds number like behavior, uh, we would expect to be uh, relatively small if it's acting on the length scale of the entire star. So bulk viscosity, where you average over all of the viscous contributions, uh, we would have to be working with um, uh, very extreme situations for this to actually matter. However, we know from Newtonian hydrodynamics theory that viscosity often acts strongly in boundary layers. That is, where you've got a transition from one particular area of the physics to another, which is often coupled by boundary conditions. And in the neutron star picture, uh, if I were to go back one slide, we can see that we have these transitions in a neutron star where we go from the atmosphere to the crust, from the crust to the outer core. And so, for example, we would expect boundary layer-like behavior in that region between the crust core transition, for example. And then the relevant length scales suddenly become much, much shorter, maybe down to centimeters. And at that point, we're going to hugely boost the impact of any one of these physical scales. Of course, the question then becomes, can our numerical simulation actually resolve that sort of layer? And hence, is it going to have an impact on the numerical simulation? So we've got a careful balancing act between the impact that it might have on the physical model and the practicality of actually numerically simulating it. And that's linked to some of the discussion that I said yesterday uh, when I was uh, saying that uh, to take into account bulk viscosity, so that the work of Alford and the, the Frankfurt group, they 
discuss the particular length scales that are needed for numerical simulations. So this is the first argument it allows us to estimate once we've got a good handle on for example dimensionless quantities and relative length scales it allows us to give back of the envelope est uh, estimations of when new particular physics is important however the problem with this argument is that it does break down in particular cases so the multi-scale theory is assuming that the the second operator, the, the L2 operator here, is acting on uh, fast time scales, short length scales, and so on and so forth. And it does an appropriate averaging over those scales that it assumes that we're not interested in or can't capture. Um, and this averaging process works as long as there's no resonances, that is, as long as there's no feedback between the short length scales and the long length scales or the fast time scales and the slow time scales and unfortunately that's explicitly not true in our problems because in hydrodynamics we expect the development of turbulence and with the development of turbulence we expect a cascade of energy from the long length scales down to the short length scales and an inverse cascade back up so we would expect this sort of argument to fail explicitly in the post-merger regime where turbulence is going to be extremely important. It would also fail horribly if we were trying to look at the development of instabilities, again, say in the post-merger regime, and important for um, jet launching and other similar effects. So at this point, the only argument that we can do is to appeal to nonlinear numerical simulation. So plug it into a model, do the simulation, see what the impact is. Um, so it's definitely useful to use the theoretical arguments to try and see which um, steps are going to be important. And it's definitely useful in order to approximate our theories to make them numerically tractable. But it's also definitely useful to implement the most complicated theories and try and see what the differences are. Right, so with that appeal to the reason why we keep extending our model, what I'm going to now move on to is non-ideal magnetohydrodynamics. So I've spent the last couple of lectures essentially arguing that ideal MHD is a reasonable assumption over the bulk of the space time and therefore we're going to use ideal MHD. And the reason that we want to use ideal MHD is that uh, when we assume that the uh, charge current flows without any resistance whatsoever, that is we take the conductivity to infinity and the Ohm's law, the general Ohm's law, then allows us or essentially forces us to relate the electric field to V cross B. Um, this means that we can eliminate the electric field from the Maxwell equations, and it also removes a couple of other problems that we will see uh, in a second. Uh, however, the requirement that the conductivity is infinite is, of course, it's very definitely an approximation. So, what we want to do is to see well when does this actually hold so this calculation by Harit Union and Sidrakian um, looked at the electro electrical conductivity tensor uh, in order to measure the conductivity in particular regions of the neutron star so it's focusing in the neutron star crust um, and it's focusing uh, in the finite temperature regime and what we see is three different particular components of the conductivity tensor. And it's measured in units of per second, essentially to see how rapidly the scattering occurs, how rapidly resistance takes place. And what you can see is that most of the time in these units, uh, the conductivity is huge, greater than 10 to the 20. However, we also see that the conductivity drops off rapidly, these are all log scales, 
So they're dropping off rapidly as we move towards the right. That is, as we're moving to lower densities. And we can also see that one crucial component in the top figure is dropping off as we move to the back. That is, as we move to high temperatures. The paper also shows, in other figures that I haven't shown here, that the conductivity drops off as the magnetic field increases. So this means that there are a couple of crucial regimes where the conductivity is orders of magnitude smaller than in other parts of the star. So in particular, in the neutron star core, especially post-merger, when the shock has propagated through and the dynamo effect has started to wind up the magnetic field, we should then expect both high temperatures and high magnetic fields. Also in the remnant disk, where we've got the matter that's been semi-expelled from the remnant, there we will have low density and high temperature. The magnetic field there is probably somewhat lower, but it's somewhat uncertain. So in both of those regions of the star, both of which are absolutely essential for quantitative multi-messenger simulations, we will need to check if non-ideal MHD, if including resistance to the flow of the charge current, is actually important, if it has an impact on our signals. Right, so uh, let me just check this uh, chat question first. Um, do I think the structure of the crust in terms of pasta, et cetera, et cetera, will affect the magnetic field evolution through changing resistivity and affecting EM counterparts like FRBs and later R processes? Um, that's a fairly long topic. I'll talk about that in detail at the question session at the end. The short answer is yes i do but uh it depends strongly on features that are currently very uncertain right so moving back to here um if we want to move away from uh, ideal mhd then we have to move away from the ohm's law imposing the simple outbreak relation between the electric and magnetic field and to do this in general we have to move towards plasma type models that is we have to uh, treat each of the particle species separately so the electrons the uh, protons the neutrons the muons and so on and so forth plus we need to account for heat transport properties uh, and we need to do this in order to get a good understanding of how the charge current is going to change when there's heat in the system or when the ratio of the particles is different in some way. So this expression that I've written on the slide that I am not going to explain because I don't need uh, to um, uh, rely on any of the details except to show how horrible things get. It's been taken from what in the context of plasma models is still relatively simple. It's only considering electrons, protons, neutrons, and heat flow. And we can see that the interaction between all of these term has, terms has led to an explosion of parameters and a horrible coupling. The key thing for our purposes is to note that the charge current J is appearing in many different places here. So recovering the charge current in some unique form from this more general Ohm's law is horrifically complicated if it's even at all possible. So the paper that I link to here is, is quite lengthy. It's largely spent trying to simplify the physics in order to relate this general Ohm's law, which is not fully general in and of itself, to simpler cases where intuitive links can be built to look at, for example, thermoelectric effects and drift effects and so on and so forth. Instead, what's typically done within the numerical community is to impose an Ohm's law that is more complicated than the simple ideal case, but still algebraically tractable. So what we do is we take our four current, the little j, 
um, that is uh, sourcing the electric fields in Maxwell's equations. We do a three plus one split by writing it in terms of the normal to the spatial slice n and the big J, the spatial part of the current, which is normal to n. We then impose that this spatial part has a piece linked to the velocity and then a piece that is normal to the velocity that depends on the electric and magnetic fields. Now, in general, this could be multiplied by, or it could be contracted with the conductivity tensor, the full tensor. In all numerical studies so far, people have assumed that the conductivity tensor can essentially be written as a scalar multiplied by the metric, maybe the uh, projected metric, projected normal to the fluid for velocity. That means that we end up with the sigma, the conductivity, appearing outside of this square bracket. Now, if we were to take the ideal MHD limit, then this sigma term would tend to infinity. Therefore, in order to have a finite current, we would need the term inside the square brackets to tend to zero. And that implies, if you do a little bit of manipulation, that E is equal to V cross B in an appropriate sense. So this is consistent with the ideal MHD limit when sigma tends to infinity. However, for finite sigma, we can use this to solve the full Einstein-Euler-Maxwell equations. So we remember that the Einstein-Euler-Maxwell equations are one equation, one PDE, the continuity equation, the four generic equations of stress, energy, momentum, and then the six equations for the magnetic and electric fields. And the electric field equation is sourced by the charge current J. So essentially DTE goes as the curl of B and then there's a charge current source. Now to fully constrain this system, we need an equation of state. That is, we need to close the hydrodynamics part by linking the pressure to the other thermodynamic variables. And we also need a constitutive, constitutive relation for the conductivity. So the uh, conductivity has to be written as a function of other variables that we know. So following on from the Sidrakian paper, we'd often write it in as a function of density, temperature and magnetic field. But for the first simple simulations, we're going to treat the conductivity as if it's a constant, a non-infinite constant. So this is in principle a set of equations of motion that we can solve in order to quantify the impact of resistivity. And as we can see on the right hand side by these simulations from Dino Sopolu uh, and uh, Rizzola, following on from work by Carlos Palenzuela and linked to work by Dana Alec and others, um, there is some substantial differences in uh, modeling of neutron star mergers when you include resistivity. However, and as I'll come back to, there's issues with these simulations. Now, those simulations uh, had to work around some significant numerical problems. And those numerical problems are linked to the evolution of the electric field. The fact that the uh, electric field evolution is sourced by the charge current. And in order to put this in the form that uh, matches to the numerical methods literature, what we need to do is to uh, do a, a simple change of variables. We write the resistivity, eta, as the inverse conductivity and write the evolution equation for the electric field as one on the conductivity multiplied by the electric field, plus other stuff. Obviously, there's also Lorentz factors and there's the curl of B and other things. But it's this particular form that the, the ODE behavior has a one on very small number multiplied by something that means that it acts as a stiff problem. So let's talk about stiffness briefly. If you've done a uh, 
detailed numerical methods course, then you will have probably come across it. Um, but this is the exercise on the exercise sheet, just illustrating the impact of stiffness in a context that we care about. So up until now, I haven't talked explicitly about how to solve the ODEs that result from our numerical methods. I've just said, we can do this. Appealed to standard methods, said to use libraries and so on and so forth. Harold Pfeiffer went into more detail on the methods used in spec, but typically in hydrodynamics cases, we want it to be sufficiently accurate while keeping it as computationally cheap as possible. And that means that we will typically use third or fourth order explicit Runge-Kutta methods. However, when dealing with stiff problems, we have a, a source term, we have a right-hand side term that is going to act on time scales comparable to the time step itself. So here I've simplified the problem to dq dt is equal to minus alpha q. Alpha is essentially an inverse time scale. So when uh, alpha to the minus one is comparable to the time step, uh, then we're going to start running into problems. And we see this when we compare the forward Euler method, which we get by replacing the uh, time derivative dq dt by the, um, the forward differencing approximation. In that case, we see that um, the numerical method is trying to react to the exponential decay. But because the true solution, the e to the minus alpha t exponential decay, is acting on e-folding timescales that are shorter than the time step itself, the numerical method overshoots. So we see this zigzag behavior. And if the mismatch in scales is too large, then that overshoot leads to oscillations which grow. And obviously this is no use whatsoever. Now the numerical alternative is to use implicit methods. So implicit methods such as the backward Euler uh, method come from replacing the time derivative dq dt with say backward differencing. The only difference in terms of the uh, resulting algorithm is that we see we have to evaluate the right hand side function which is generally going to be non-linear at the future time step which we don't know. So whereas the forward Euler method is explicit given the known data qn we can immediately explicitly compute the unknown qn plus one and the only cost is evaluating the function f. In the implicit methods the unknown qn satisfies this non-linear algebraic equation. And of course, there are algorithms for solving non-linear algebraic equations, but they are slow and expensive compared to uh, computing something explicitly. However, given the choice between fast and unstable, or essentially fast and wrong, you would pick slow and correct every time. So this would seem to say that if we're dealing with non-ideal MHD, and if we're dealing with situations that are near the ideal MHD limit, and we remember that for the bulk of the simulation time and for the bulk of the space time, we are still going to be close to the ideal MHD limit, this would seem to suggest that our only choice is to work with implicit solvers. Now, Implicit solvers, I've said, are slow. The question is, how slow? And the answer is, in general, they can be orders of magnitude, somewhere between three and five orders of magnitude slower than explicit methods. So that, at first glance, seems to make resistive MHD completely impractical to solve. But people have done it. So how do we do it? And there's two approaches we can take. The first one, is to use a numerical trick. So the idea of the numerical trick is to note that the stiff source term is only a small part of the problem that we're trying to solve. 
the bulk of the equations that we're trying to solve are determined by the flux terms. They're determined by non-stiff sources and so on and so forth. So the idea behind the implicit explicit numerical methods or IMEX schemes is to take a general system. I haven't written this completely generally, but uh, this is the form in the paper where we have non-stiff parts of the behavior given in this case by the flux derivatives and stiff parts of the behavior given by the source term, which goes like epsilon to the minus one. Then what we do is we write down a general Runge-Kutta method for this scheme. Now, in a Runge-Kutta method, we have to compute each intermediate stage evaluation. So that would be the QIs here. Uh, for each individual stage, it's going to depend on the previous uh, time step, so QN, it's going to depend on previous stages that we've computed. So that's QJs, where J runs from one up to I minus one. And it may also depend on the current stage or even future stages. So from K equals I up until the future. Now, all of the terms in green, previous stages or previous time steps, they can be computed explicitly. All of the terms in red, they have to be computed implicitly. So the trick, as written down by Pareshi and Rousseau, uh, and extended uh, greatly, is to choose the coefficients, the AIKs, in order to minimize the amount of implicit calculation that we have to do. So these IMEX schemes have been coupled to numerical simulations of resistive MHD. First done by Palenzuela and others. Uh, this has been extended to a range of different contexts. I particularly suggest looking at the work of Isabel Cordero Carrion, who's used IMEX schemes to deal with issues in spherical coordinates. This allows for practical simulations of um, resistive MHD with resistivities, uh, or if you prefer conductivities, of up to 10 to the 11 per second. So this is a substantial exploration of the parameter space. Unfortunately, it's still five to 10 orders of magnitude away from the uh, sort of conductivities that we would expect in a true physical neutron star. As the implicit step is still the limiting factor, and that is still limited by the size of the epsilon here, and epsilon plate is essentially the resistivity, we can see that it's still going to be impractical to run full merger simulations with full nonlinear MHD. So the second approach that we can take is an analytical trick. And this analytical trick is specifically taken in order to work with um, uh, systems that we expect to relax to an equilibrium. So the name of this um, property or the, the name of this approach is relaxation systems. So the idea is that we've got a large system, say uh, resistive MHD, and there's an equilibrium for this system. That is, there's something that it's trying to be forced towards, and that would be ideal MHD. So there is a particular subset of variables, in our case, the electric fields, which are going to act on very rapid timescales. They're going to be driven towards a particular value. E is going to be driven towards V cross B. So whilst those variables are acting and reacting quickly, the other variables are going to evolve relatively slowly. So what we do is we split our system into two separate sets of variables. And that's what the, the toy model on this slide represents. Q are the variables that are evolving slowly. They're the things that we're going to observe. 
V are the variables that are evolving quickly. Now they're going to evolve uh, by being pushed around by the slow variables, add vectors along, but there's also going to be a source term and that's going to react on a short time scale. So epsilon here is playing the role of a resistivity. Um, it's a short time scale corresponding to the fact that it's a small number. So we note that in the equilibrium case, where epsilon tends to zero, it must be the case that the source term, the piece in the square brackets, vanishes. In other words, V is equal to F of Q. What that means is that we can completely ignore the second equation of motion, because we don't need to solve for V anymore. It's given by this constraint that follows from the equilibrium system. We can then replace the first equation, we can replace all of the V terms. So we get DTQ plus DX of F equals zero. And we get a standard conservation law. So that's essentially what we're doing with ideal MHD. We're taking the limit where the resistivity goes to zero. This is showing that the source term, the piece in brackets in Ohm's law, has to vanish. That's imposing that E is equal to V cross B, and that allows us to drop the evolution equations for the electric fields. So when we want to move away from ideal MHD and in instead work with systems that are close to MHD, we can do what's called a Chapman Enskog expansion, which is that we can take our fast variable V, we're thinking of that as the electric field, and we can do a perturbation expansion about equilibrium. So we can write V is equal to F of Q, which is assumed known, plus epsilon times some correction term V1. We plug this perturbation expansion back into the equations of motion above and rearrange to get V1. And this will be given purely in terms of Q if we look to leading order in epsilon. So what this allows us to do is to, again, drop the equation of motion for V, because we now know what V is in terms of Q up to first order in epsilon. That means we get the equilibrium system, DTQ plus DXF, but we also get a correction term to leading order in epsilon. And it's important to note that this correction term involves second derivatives. So the derivative of some function of Q multiplied by the derivative of Q. So this is the smaller system. It's only going to evolve the slow variables. And the correction term looks like a diffusive correction. So what this is going to do is capture the long length scale, long time scale behavior that is the first ordering perturbation around the equilibrium solution. So we can extend this to uh, resistive MHD. So the graduate student here at Southampton has done the hard work of doing the full chapman Enskog expansion and applying it to the resistive MHD case, um, the equations rapidly become absolutely hideous. So I'm not even able to give you the sort of indicative form. So I'm just showing you some of the key terms here. Um, so to leading order, we get the terms that we expect. We get the time derivative of Q, and now Q is the, the variables that go into making up ideal MHD. We get the flux terms, that's the di of little f zero, and we get the source terms, that's the root minus g little s zero. But we get three correction terms, and all of them have an implicit factor of the resistivity in them. We get a correction to the fluxes, that's the big F. We get a correction to the geometric sources, that's the big S. And we get a term that looks like a second derivative, looks like a diffusive term. So this is in practice more complicated, although conceptually it's very similar 
to the uh, scalar problem discussed on the slides above. Now, it's also important to note that in the MHD case, we have to deal with constraints. We have to deal with the um, constraints from um, div b equals zero. And we also have to work out what happens to Ohm's law when we do this expansion. Now, the div b equals zero constraint is unchanged to leading order. And also, when we do the leading order expansion check of Ohm's law, what we end up with is the same relation between E and V cross B as we would expect. So this has reduced our 11 equations for the Einstein Euler Maxwell system back to eight equations as in ideal MHD, but with small correction terms applied to the flux source and an additional diffusion term. This can be solved using explicit numerical methods because it is a non-stiff problem. As epsilon tends to zero, all of these correction terms smoothly tend to zero with it. So that means as we take the resistivity to zero, each of these pieces is going to vanish. Um, so that means that we can use any explicit solver that we would want. And in collaboration with Bruno Giacomazzo, we've checked that this works for the neutron star merger regime. At least in the cases that we've checked so far, the observable signals are modified by relatively small amounts. Here we've been looking at resistivities on the order of 10 to the 16 per, uh, per seconds. Sorry, that's conductivities. So this is about as resistive as we could possibly justify. Uh, we're seeing some impact, but it's relatively small. The one final thing I should note is that uh, whilst this is extremely effective near the ideal MHD limit, um, there's no free lunch. There is a new time step restriction. So this is not like the time step restriction that you would expect to come from the stiff ODE problem for the full nonlinear resistive MHD. Instead, it results from the diffusive second order derivative, uh, essentially the D term at the end. Now, if you do numerical modeling of, say, the heat equation or the linear diffusion equation, then you will find that there is a time step restriction where the time step has to scale like the grid spacing squared. So for small grid spacing, this is much more restrictive than the standard hyperbolic CFL condition where the time step has to scale like the grid spacing itself. However, what's important is what are the proportionality constants in front of that uh, scaling step. And it turns out that for the uh, resistivities and grid cells that we can currently use in practical neutron star mergers, this time step restriction is no more restrictive than our current CFL condition. It does mean that as we move to higher resolutions, we might struggle to use this particular method in order to uh, get corrections that are uh, linked to uh, resistive MHD. Right, that was a very long initial section. Um, so I'm going to pause here for a few minutes. Uh, if there are any questions specific to this first section, then please drop them into the, the chat. Um, I think the, the question that Surendra dropped into the, the chat earlier on is sufficiently broad that I'll save that one till the end. So Surendra is asking if the resistivity is being put in artificially, it's not being derived from first principles. Um, this is a, um, it, it's not a, a fully, I, I'm gonna find it slightly difficult to answer, answer this question, um, but the, the short answer is um, there are derivations of the Ohm's law corresponding to that um, resistive charge current that I wrote down. So it is being uh, 
derived from small scale approximations. Um, however, um, I would say a lot of the assumptions that go into that derivation are informed more, more by Newtonian physics than necessarily by relativistic physics. So if I were to um, look at the distinction between the two Ohm's laws that I wrote down. So this complicated plasma case here is derived from first principles in full relativity via an action principle um, and looks at the couplings uh, between all of the different particle species. This particular Ohm's law is much more informed by a derivation that's done in Newtonian theory that appeals to the particle behavior in Newtonian theory and the local behavior of individual charged particles uh, using Galilean transformations and so on and so forth. So my expectations would be that, except in the most extreme situations, uh, this uh, model for resistive MHD is going to be a reasonable approximation in simple cases. However, it's dropping a number of features of the, the full model, and it's not fully clear that it's doing it in uh, a completely self-consistent sense. So it's not fully clear that the... Um, the resistive scattering and the the interaction between the different particle species is being averaged over in terms of whatever the small parameter is that's being done in order to produce this uh, charge current. Is that necessarily a problem? Well, um, if it turns out that for any physical conductivity there's no uh, impact even with this particular tensor then it would probably suggest that even the, the fully correct totally self-consistent method would also show no impact provided there's no nonlinear couplings provided there's no instabilities and so on and so forth um, however it does mean that we should definitely take the results from these sort of resistive simulations as um, qualitative rather than quantitative in terms of the the impact of their effects in terms of deviations away from the ideal model i would say that's probably true of most of the models that we use it's just that in this case i've got a slightly more uh, uh background knowledge about the the models that are going in and therefore i'm slightly more skeptical Can I please elaborate what features of the binary neutron star are affected? Okay, so uh, the simulations that we've been doing with the chapman enzgog expansion, we have barely started on um, covering the parameter space. So it's hard um, for me to make any general statements based on what we've done there. I would instead recommend that people look at this paper by Dina Sopper with Sola, Alec, and um, I, sorry, I forget the other author. Um, so the key features that you can see um, are, so this particular figure um, is showing the, um, the density in the top and the norm of the magnetic field in the bottom and it's showing it as essentially a cut through the x direction as time progresses so what you'll see is on the left the resistive mhd case and you'll see the magnetic field is considerably more extended uh, outwards so the uh, norm of the magnetic field is considerably lower at early times near the core um, this means that uh, 
I would say the most likely interpretation is that the dynamo effect, which winds up the magnetic field strength, has been resisted during this merger. So the um, strength of the magnetic field has decreased. Uh, now, you would normally expect that to reduce the pressure support and therefore leads to a um, shorter lived remnant neutron star. However, you may just be able to see, let me see if I can zoom in a bit, these green curves. So the green curves are the position of the black hole horizon as measured by an apparent horizon finder. And we can see that the impact of resistivity leads to a longer lived remnant. Um, there's also a lot more structure in the exterior magnetic field. So um, the, the magnetic field outside the black hole is now stronger in the resistive case. Essentially, in the ideal case, all of the magnetic field gets swallowed very rapidly. This is also linked to uh, differences in outflows, particularly before the merger. Now, there are a couple of things that I would say. So one is that the uh, the formation time of the apparent horizon often seems to be highly sensitive um, to small details in the simulations. Um, you can often see, for example, uh, grid resolution surveys by, for example, Giacomazzo's group show that um, small changes in resolution can lead to relatively large changes in the formation time of the horizon. Um, so again, small changes in the physical inputs can equally have an impact on this relatively sensitive feature. So it's probably more relevant to look at the outflow uh, behavior before the uh, remnant is formed. And in that case, you're looking at what's the impact on the uh, transport of angular momentum, uh, what's the impact on the remnant disk. Um, so your comment to say that essentially the jet physics, the high massive neutron star lifetime, the accretion disk dynamics are going to be mainly affected. It's definitely the case that it's the post merger effects that you can um, expect to be most uh, affected in this case. The pre merger effects are going to be small, if not negligible, because even in the resistive models, we don't have a good model of the exterior electric mag electromagnetic fields and even if we did we expect the interaction of the uh, exterior fields with the uh, in spiral physics to essentially be negligible um, so we definitely through the early parts of merger and post-merger that we expect the largest um, impact Okay, so Prasad says, you mentioned that in the neutral star interior, the crust and core region meeting could be thought of as a boundary and grid resolutions are important. I'd like to know for neutral star simulations, what type of grid is suitable, whether a uniform grid or a non-uniform grid is appropriate? Oh, that's a long, big question. Right. Um, I would usually say that Okay, so thinking about things as a boundary, we need to be slightly careful here. Um, so there's work that I've done with previous students where I made the argument that the transition, for example, between the crust and the core happens sharply, happens on uh, length scales that are order of a centimeter or so, and that's something that we're never going to be able to resolve numerically. So whether we use a uniform or a non-uniform grid, whether we work in spherical coordinates or Cartesian coordinates, that jump is essentially going to be unresolvable smoothly. So instead, what we should do is we should treat it as a jump between different physical models, um, and we should then impose appropriate boundary conditions at that jump using some sort of embedded boundary numerical method. And that, can be made to work reasonably well. Um, the question is whether we've got a handle on what the appropriate boundary conditions should be between the models. And I think the answer there is no. Uh, 
we don't have a handle on what that boundary condition should be. Um, so if we're moving towards uh, the, the sense that we're, we're going to try and capture these uh, transition regions, then I would say the type of grid is essentially irrelevant. If, on the other hand, we're thinking of using a single model throughout the entire domain, um, then I think um, we definitely have to use some sort of non-uniform grid. Most, well, all current simulations tend to use adaptive mesh refinement, some sort of box inside a box, and numerically you transfer uh, information from the coarser grids that extend further out into the domain onto the boundaries of the finer grid in order that they take more time steps. There has been work on using multi-patch grids. So Harold Pfeiffer showed the, the spectral multi-domain approach that SPEC uses. Uh, there's also been work particularly by Christian Reiswig and Eric Schnetter and Peter Dina and others on uh, doing multi-patch uh, approaches for finite difference and finite volume codes, largely for vacuum simulations, uh, but it has been applied to matter simulations as well. Uh, there are numerical issues uh, in dealing with transitions between different grids when solving for matter models. In particular, um, because we're using a flux conservative approach in order to work with um, uh, in order to be able to correctly deal with shocks we have to ensure that the fluxes match up at any transition between different grid resolutions and uh, with finite difference and finite volume schemes that's it it's known how to do it but it's uh, practically somewhat complex it's also known that if you have that that correction term, which applies to the flux terms, doesn't necessarily help with source terms, particularly strong sources. So whilst this correction has been input in certain cases and is essential in, for example, simulations of core collapse supernovae done with uh, relativistic codes, it's not clear that it's necessarily appropriate when you couple to for example, radiation transport. So for that reason, I would tend to suggest that you should always start with the simplest gridding structure possible. Start with simple uniform grids uh, and only move towards non-uniform grids if you find that it's impractical to use a uniform grid. We'll come back and discuss that a bit more after I've uh, covered the uh, DG methods in the next section. And then we can talk about that in the question session right at the end. Okay, so if that is the final, oh no, one more question, thank you. Right, um, if that's the final question, I'll be back in 15 seconds to talk about the uh, final uh, Right, so as promised, um, the first section was about uh, additional physical models and the numerical techniques we need to work with that. The second topic is to talk about something purely numerical. So yesterday, Harold Pfeiffer introduced the discontinuous Galerkin methods, and as he said, they're currently extremely popular in that there's a lot of work being thrown at them. And what I want to talk about is why, from a hydrodynamic point of view, they may be useful, but also why, from a hydrodynamic point of view, they're incredibly problematic. So, to move back to yesterday's lecture, where I introduced the different gridding methods, I talked about 
finite differences and finite volumes. And I particularly emphasize the fact that we don't have information about the solution over the entirety of the space time, that what we're doing is taking a limited amount of information, a finite amount of information, and then we're imposing some reconstruction of how the solution behaves over the entirety of the space time. And this is typically going to be using some sort of piecewise polynomial. And that reconstructed form is used to compute some additional terms, say the values of the solution at the intercell boundaries or the intercell fluxes. Now, the key point that I want to make, a key disadvantage of finite difference and finite volume methods, is that once you've calculated the crucial information based on these reconstructions, so for example, once we've calculated the intercell fluxes, we throw away all of this high order information. We're not storing any of this information at all. It's all gone. We only store the values of the grid points or we store the values of the cell integral averages. We should compare this to finite element approaches where we're going to be storing all of the modes of the solution and we're going to be updating all of the modes of the solution. And those modes give us the values of the solution at every single point in the space time. So therefore we're retaining this high order information at all stages and updating all of that information at all stages. So we're not wasting huge amounts of computational power. Now the second problem is communication. So when we're doing high order methods, when we're doing methods that are say fourth or sixth or ninth order accurate, in those cases using finite differences or finite volumes, what we have to do is to get information about the, uh, the non-local behavior of the solution by looking at ever further and further away points. For example, let's think about um, how would we approximate the derivative at the grid point xi in this finite difference method. Let's suppose we wanted to get the derivative correct to fourth order. That would mean that we would need to take the derivative of a fifth order polynomial. In order to have a fifth order polynomial, we would need six pieces of information. That would mean that we would need the value of six points. So not just the value xi, but we would need six, well, five points around it. So maybe three to the left and two to the right. So that means that high order finite difference and finite volume schemes have to communicate with, they have to get the information from cells or grid points that are a long way away from themselves. And this is a real issue for big simulations on modern supercomputers. So as a quick digression, modern simulations have essentially four things that slow them down. First is how fast they do operations, the flop count. Second is memory. If you can't fit your quantities in memory, then you're having to read them off disk and that's slow. The third, which is surprisingly important for our simulations, is how fast you can write stuff to the disk. And the final part, which is hugely important when you use multiple processes and split your calculation across each of these different processes is how fast the different bits of the simulation communicate with each other. Now, I showed Summit in the first lecture as the current fastest supercomputer. It's the first one to get close to doing 10 to the 18 floating point operations per second. And it's as we're heading towards that sort of exascale level where computers will do an exaflop, um, people have settled on designs that essentially take any given uh, job, any given evolution and split it across huge numbers of processes. So numerical methods that do very small amounts of communication 
but large amounts of computation are definitely going to be able to benefit from these types of machine. High order finite volume and finite difference methods just do too much communication. That means that we won't be able to utilize uh, future supercomputers to their best ability. And in the worst case, that means we won't get computer time because we're not using the resources appropriately. So the reason that people are so excited about discontinuous lurking methods is that it gets around the problem of waste, as we've talked about from the finite element scheme, and it also, in principle, gets around the uh, issues with communication. And the reason for that is because of the way it works with the weak form of the solution. So again, Harold Pfeiffer covered this, but just to rewrite it in the notation that we've used so far, we take our equation of motion, dtq plus divergence of f is equal to the source term s. Now we're going to revisit the weak form. So rather than integrating over space and time, what we're instead going to do is to multiply by a differentiable function phi called the test function and integrate that by parts, integrate that using Gauss or Stokes. So we have the volume integrals of phi dtq. From the integration by parts, we pick up the surface intercell flux or interelement flux. We also have the integral of f grad phi. So that's where we've moved the spatial derivatives from the divergence of the flux, so away from the solution, which might be discontinuous, and onto the test function phi, which we can choose to be at least piecewise smooth. And then there's another volume integral on the right hand side, and that involves the source term. So the key point here is that because the finite element approximation, the finite element representation gives us the values of the solution and hence the flux everywhere, we can immediately evaluate all of these terms. And we can do that locally to within a cell in the cases where we're integrating over the cell, where we're integrating over the volume. So all of the volume integrals are purely local. The reason why we don't care about the derivative of phi is because we're allowed to choose the test function as we like. The only place where we couple the neighboring cells is in the intercell flux, the surface integral. And that's only coupling it to our neighbors. And again, because we can get high order representations of the value of the solution within each cell, then in principle, we can com compute that intercell flux, that surface integral, only by looking at the immediate neighbors. This massively reduces the amount of communication that we have to do. Right, so just to look at the, the practical way that we do it, we expand both the solution and also the test function in terms of some basis functions. Here I'm using my standard convention and, and using Legendre uh, terms. Now the coefficients, the, the Q hat M's, that they're going to store the modes within each individual cell um, and they're going to depend on time. When we substitute that into the previous week form, we see we, we've got integrals of basis functions, that is integrals of Legendre functions, and we've got things like time derivatives of the Q hat terms, and we've got the phi hat terms and so on and so forth. Because these don't depend on space, we can pull those straight out. And then we're left with the mass matrix stiffness vector form that Harold Pfeiffer talked about yesterday. So the mass matrix M and the stiffness vector S can be pre-computed. The intercell flux, which comes from the surface integral of the PM, PN, phi M times the F hat, that has to be computed using something like a, a Riemann solver. So higher accuracy, less communication. You can see why people who want to use the latest and greatest supercomputers to do the biggest and best numerical simulations think that this is going to be a great thing.
the problem is that we get issues with shocks. Now, Harold Pfeiffer showed explicitly the wonderful convergence properties, both of spectral methods and of discontinuous Galerkin methods, but he was focusing on smooth solutions. So in the top right hand corner, you will see illustrations of a DG method applied to the advection equation for a smooth solution where everything is wonderful and for a discontinuous solution, this top hat function, uh, where things are not nearly so good. So the blue curve shows that we get the sort of Gibbs oscillations uh, that we discussed in the last lecture, even with DG methods. Now, Harold Pfeiffer noted that you can use H refinement to get around this problem. You can essentially try and align your grid to the discontinuities. And this has been discussed a lot in the literature, um, but personally I am very skeptical that by dropping to a low order scheme, so in order to avoid the discontinuities, while refining the grid, that is what H refinement is, I'm skeptical that this can be done in a practical fashion, dynamically in a nonlinear problem. So essentially what you'd have to do is as the neutron star merge, uh, as the neutron stars merge, you'd have to massively refine the grid by detecting where the shocks occur. This would hugely reduce the time step because again, that's got to be linked to the size of the grid cell. There certainly are examples of doing this successfully in the numerical methods literature, but there's also discussions of where it might fail. So there are other alternatives as to how to extend DG methods to discontinuous solutions. Essentially, those extensions uh, look towards applying limiting processes, so extending the slope limiting that we used um, uh, in the last lecture applied to vi finite volume schemes. What they do is they try and measure when the reconstruction is problematic, and then they apply the limiting to the individual modes, the individual moments themselves. So that can be done here, and as we can see in the top right with the red dotted curve, it is completely eliminating the Gibbs oscillations. At the same time, we can see it is smearing out uh, the behavior near the discontinuities. Now, the problem that I have with the, the limiting is not the smearing. That's something that should go away with resolution and should converge nicely, even if it doesn't converge at the high order that we would hope. The problem that I have with limiting is that in order to check whether or not the reconstruction is in trouble, this is having to couple neighboring cells. It's having to look at the moments of the neighbors. This is therefore increasing the computational cost by increasing the communication. Even if we only add one more cell, communicating one extra cell with DG methods is relatively more expensive. The reason for this is that when we do a communication with a finite difference or a finite volume scheme, we have to communicate one value per variable per cell. So if we had to communicate five cells, then for a scalar problem, we would communicate five values. For DG methods, you're communicating one value per moment per variable per cell. So if we're using uh, a DG method with five moments, then communicating a single cell for a scalar problem communicates five values. So adding more cells uh, communicating as is needed in order to do limiting will immediately eliminate um, or significantly reduce the advantages that DG has. The final point that I want to make is that um, comparing finite difference and finite volume schemes against DG methods is not necessarily straightforward. Um, in essence, what you want to do is to compare the efficiency. What is the runtime required in order to get a certain level of error? 
we certainly don't want to compare what's the error computed with a given number of cells because the qualitative comparisons don't really work out. So that's what the picture at the bottom is doing. Um, so let me just zoom in there correctly. So again, this is for smooth solutions for the advection equation. The DG scheme here is using limiting to try and get the sort of apples with apples comparison with a we know finite difference scheme. The we know, uh, sorry, the DG schemes uh, with the dotted lines are converging at third order, fifth order, and ninth order. So the convergence order is the number of modes plus one. The we know schemes are converging at fifth order, ninth order, and thirteenth order. That is, the convergence um, order is given by twice r minus one. r is the number of neighboring cells that it has to look at. So, in essence, these we know methods are having to communicate with three neighboring cells and transmit three values for the r equals three case. The DG methods are having to look at two neighboring cells and hence communicate two M values. So um, you can do the, the sort of communication comparison that way. The point that I want to make is that these two methods, so the, the blue we know curve and the yellow DG curve, look pretty similar in terms of their efficiency curve. And they're both converging, or both meant to be converging, at fifth order. Equally, the red we know curve and the blue DG curve, they're both meant to be converging at ninth order. And again, they're roughly comparable in the efficiency curve. The point is that with this specific pair of simulations that I've highlighted with arrows, the number of grid cells is hugely different. So the DG method is only using eight grid cells, the we know method using more than 50. The errors are comparable, the computational costs are comparable, the number of grid cells hugely different. Obviously that has an impact on the memory requirements. My assumption is that memory is not the limiting thing right now. Now this is going to be highly implementation dependent. Uh, this is uh, an efficient implementation of a we know method. That's because we know is a mature technology. It's been shown to work in a wide variety of simulations and there's high order finite difference methods that have been shown to work with neutron stars. The DG implementation is something that I threw together fairly rapidly. DG methods, at least to me and to our field, are new. And so the implementations of the sort of thing that I did may not be the most efficient. So it's quite possible that DG methods will improve substantially, particularly once more robust and effective ways to avoid Gibbs oscillations are known. So my opinion is very much that DG methods are not obviously better, and there's probably considerably more work to make them uh, effective for neutron st star simulations. If I were to start a simulation today, I would definitely use finite volume or finite difference techniques. However, I equally expect that in five years time, or certainly in 10, that the best neutron star simulations will be using something related to DG or finite element methods, because their advantage and their advantages, particularly on the largest supercomputers, is large. Right, we have around about 10 minutes left. Um, I wanted to leave uh, a reasonable amount of time for any final questions, so I'm going to stop there. But I would note this final slide for the future uh, highlights some additional uh, directions, particularly in the numerical modeling community, that I personally think are going to be relevant. I'll particularly highlight the ideas of adaptive model refinement and the ideas of uncertainty quantification. And if we time, we can discuss those in the questions. But meantime, thank you for your attention and I'll move towards 
answering the questions in the chat. So the first question in the chat from Aditya is, are Gibbs oscillations present generically for all choices of basis functions? And the answer is yes. Um, while there are always special cases and always particular loopholes, I, I would say that uh, for, for generic problems, yes, you are always going to see some sort of Gibbs oscillations. Uh, Surendra says, uh, what about solving the equations in four dimensions by escaping the time step constraints um, and later in post-processing decomp decomposing the four dimensional solutions into three plus one? Now, there was some work on this by, uh, I always associate Matt Anderson with this when he was working at uh, LSU with um, uh, Jörg, I've forgotten Jörg's surname, um, and Manuel Tilio and Luis Lehner and so on and so forth. So this would be probably sometime between about 2002 and 2006. So we're, we're talking 15 years ago. Uh, the problem is that moving to the four dimensions doesn't escape the time step constraint. What moving to four dimensions and, and working with finite element approaches does is it allows you to construct a grid and essentially finite elements that are going to vary with time and space that allows you to optimize um, your time step in particular regimes. Um, the sort of post-processing decomposition that you're talking about is necessary even for three plus one solutions if you're trying to extract gauge invariant quantities. Um, so my personal feeling is that while Matt Anderson's and collaborators work show that it's possible to work in four dimensions, uh, it didn't show that the, it was necessarily practical. And instead, people have largely relied on working in three plus one with particular gauge conditions. I particularly recommend looking at the work of, for example, Anil Zenginoglu on the hyperboloidal slicings. If you're interested in how to extrapolate gravitational waves to arbitrarily large distances, or alternatively, people work on light cone coordinates. So essentially a two plus two decomposition instead of a, a three plus one decomposition. Okay, um, Swanin mentions how much does the strength and orientation of the magnetic field affect the gravitational waves from binary mergers? Um, the answer there is considerably. Um, so the, the strength in particular is associated with, with a wide range of behaviors. Um, to, to some extent, the, the in-spiral-like behavior is not hugely affected because the, uh, what people believe to be physically realistic input magnetic fields uh, give you magnetic pressures that are always going to be uh, below 1% of the actual hydrodynamic pressure. So in that sense, the in-spiral phase is largely unaffected. What is important is the development of the magnetic field through the merger phase. So the, the figure that I'm showing here from one of the uh, Kyuchi's simulations of the development of the magnetic field and the impact of uh, small scale magnetic features and magnetic turbulence, that is one of the, the big questions and the big worries in the field today. Um, the question about the magnetic orientation, um, that's been somewhat less studied. There's been some work on it, particularly by Luis Lena and Carlos Panzuela. Um, it's my uh, understanding is that it seems to be less important than the raw magnetic field strength because the post-merger physics is largely dominated by the the form and structure of the magnetic field, which is dominated by the turbulence effects, which is, um, and, and the sort of things like the magnetorotational instability. And for those, you're most interested in the magnitude rather than the orientation. But um, there, there's always the, 
the impact on, uh, of these orientation effects on the emitted signals. And that's something that is likely to affect the emitted electromagnetic signals far more than the gravitational waves themselves. Right, I also promised to answer Surendra's first question about the structure of the crust and pasta phases and so on and so forth, how that affects the magnetic field evolution and how it impacts resistivity and Furbies and all sorts of things. Now, um, what I should really first of all say is you should make a distinction between the crust where we're genuinely saying that the material is behaving like an elastic lattice and the pasta phases which is usually expected to occur in the outer core where it's energetically prefer uh, preferable on the micro scale for the uh, neutrons to, to form into structures that are not lattice like but uh, may be stringy or may have holes or voids um so there are conflicting understandings of what the importance of these features might be um in essence uh, the question largely comes down to what's the impact on the temperature and magnetic field evolution through late stages of in spiral merger and early post merger uh in particular you expect the magnetic field to be guided or even pinned to um, fluid or elastic um, matter where there is some sort of structure and directionality. You particularly see this in, for example, models of pulsar glitches where the crust shattering and rearranging is linked to a shaking in the magnetic field where the magnetic field has been pinned to the elastic crust. Now, the assumptions based on early calculations of the crust said that uh, even in the most optimistic scenarios, the crust would break um, during the in spiral phase. Essentially, the, the resonances between the, um, between the modes in the crust and the orbital frequencies would lead to the crust melting uh, before the neutron stars merge. That would mean there would be no elastic uh, structure and the magnetic field would be free to move as it wished through that merger phase. However, um, recent calculations um, and some recent discussions have suggested that it might be the case that elastic matter might survive even through the temperatures created by the shocks in the merger. Um, I haven't had enough time to get to grips with what these latest results might suggest, um, but if it is truly the case that some parts of the elastic phases or some parts of the pasta phases um, would, have, uh, would uh, survive through the merger, then this could have a substantial impact on the magnetic field evolution. I particularly recommend taking a look at the work of Jose Pons and uh, Figano from, I think, about eight years ago, where they're looking at the evolution on very long time scales of the post-merger remnant. So what they were doing is they were essentially looking at snapshots. They were looking at the impact of the magnetic field structure on the heat transport properties and the impact on the formation of the crust. So that gives some qualitative understanding of how heat transport properties would be affected and hence particularly on the R process uh, results that you should expect due to having some sort of elastic structure there. Uh, the numerics, of course, the precise values of the coefficients, um, it's th this recent suggestion that they have, uh, they're going to be changed radically that make, makes me suggest it might be relevant for the early stages of, of the uh, post-neutron star, uh, po sorry, post-merger remnant. What the impact is on EM counterparts like fast radio bursts, I have no idea. I'm most definitely not on top of what are the reasonable models of FRBs. 
Um, my feeling is that um, it's more likely for neutron star mergers that we're going to care about its impact on the SGRBs. And of course, uh, modeling of SGRBs is what you're going to be, uh, or part of what you're going to be looking at for the rest of this school. So I think I will leave that to the experts. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jan. Are there any more questions? Okay, so if not, uh, let's thank uh, Jan for this very wonderful uh, summary of this uh, whole field, um, as well as a uh, uh, really nice introduction to the numerical methods of for the uh, hydrodynamics simulations. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much all for your attention and uh, goodbye. Yeah.